Victory World War II. This is the second edition of a beloved classic by Columbia Games. I think I own the first edition. I think it is somewhere on this wall here, but I haven't played it. But I have played this one, so I can report about this one. Victory World War II is a sandbox World War II game, which is not about World War II. I know that's kind of counterintuitive and paradoxical, maybe. It is a sandbox game based on the technology and the doctrine of World War II. It comes with a large number of units, it comes with a large number of maps, and so you can create all sorts of different situations that may not be exactly based on Kursk or the Battle of Britain or France 1940, but they can, if you want, be reminiscent of those situations. Or you can simply create imaginary situations that, however, will still work in a way reminiscent of, well, what would happen if they had been fought by those units with those strengths and those weaknesses. The basic set comes with two again, generic World War II based armies, red and blue, traditional, uh, the traditional colors that you have in military wargaming. Um, and they're also mirror-like, so the two sides have exactly the same units. You can expand the game by buying, well, a third generic army, orange blocks, and then they're also historically based armies, so you have the American, the German, and the Soviet. So, um, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with these units, a lot of different scenarios, so, but again, they will all be based on World War II elements. For two players mainly, it can be played solo, but of course you're losing a lot of the fog of war, which is such a key element in block war games. So it can also be played by more than two players, and it can get pretty epic if you play with a lot of maps, a lot of different countries, multiple players controlling multiple controlling different countries. So actually, this is a game that can, one of those war games that can really get big and accommodate a large number of players. But before I go any further, why don't I show you how the game works? The game comes with a number of maps. You have some in the basic set and then you can add more. Here I have the complete set. And so some will have mainly water with some islands here and there. Some will be mainly land, some um, kind of like middle of the road. And here I prepared a scenario simply by putting together four kind of random maps. I wanted the balance when I was showing you the game uh, between water, some islands here and there, and then a main land mass. So you can really do a lot of different things. You can use the maps to create situations that are reminiscent of, say, the Eastern Front, or the Pacific Campaign, North Africa, really a lot, a lot of variety. These maps have different features on them, as you can expect. We have roads, very important for supplies. Again, the biggest difference that you see immediately is the difference between land and water, with all sorts of rules that will cover the way units interact with land and water. Then we have towns, represented by those dots there, that don't have anything printed in them. And then we have cities. Cities have numbers printed on them. That is the number of production points the city is worth. Production points also work as victory points. In a standard scenario, the player that controls the most production points at the end of the game wins the game. This is a block war game. That means the military units are represented by wooden blocks with stickers placed on them. The sticker will tell you what the unit represents and a lot of information about the unit. During gameplay, the unit will stand upright facing the owning player. So, say that is those are units belonging to the blue player that is sitting on that side of the table, and here we have the red player sitting here. And so that's why you see where your opponent has the units, but you don't know what they are. When combat is resolved, when units are in the same hex, then you reveal the units, pretty much flipping them face up but without changing the orientation, and at the end of combat you put them back upright. And so this is a great way to keep track of fog of war, I mean to create fog of war, but also keep, to keep track of information, because the number that you see here around the the big black number that you see around the block 
is the number of strength points that the unit has and the number that is on top of the unit as the unit stands upright is the current number of strength points. So the orientation of the block also allows you to keep track of the number of strength points that the unit has. The unit takes a hit, you rotate to indicate that now that unit, for example, only has two strength points left not only one, then maybe the unit gets replacement, so it's back to two. So by rotating the block, you can keep track of a lot of things. Units are divided in three main groups. We have land units, we have air units, and water units. And within each group, of course, there are further divisions, because water units, or sea units, naval units, have ships, but also submarines. There are different types of airplanes, torpedo bombers, bombers from medium to long range, then we have fighters, so different things. And then, of course, a lot of variety in land units. So when we have armor, we have infantry, we have cavalry, special units such as paratroopers, marines, all with different, slightly different rules that gives them different advantages and sometimes different limitations. Now, you choose a scenario to play or you create your own. The game comes with a number of scenarios, but you can easily create your own once you become familiar with the idea. More are available online on the site of the publisher. So you're never gonna run out of scenarios. Then you will set up the game, you will start with a number of blocks, a standard scenario would be that you start with a number of production points and you set up by building units after you spend those production points. Or you can simply, if you want to get things simpler, you can simply start with 10 units for each player at full strength. I'm putting units kind of randomly here and there. I hope I don't do things that are, that are too silly, like, I don't know tanks in the middle of the ocean or things like that. Oh, these units would be facing us. And so you will prepare, you will set up, you will set up your situation. Now, units, as you can see, uh, their stats are printed on those blocks and there are a lot, so there's a lot of information there. So that may be a little bit confusing or threatening or daunting at the beginning, but thanks to the system, there is really a lot that you can keep track of, and that adds a lot of chrome and a lot of detail. These large numbers around the blocks, as we said, represent the current amount of strength points that the unit has. This small number here represents the number of production points produced by cities, that it takes to build a stamp of that unit. So for example, by spending two production points, I could add a step to reduce unit, or I can take a unit from off the board and build it at one step. If I were to spend two more steps, I would add two more production points, I would add another step and so on and so forth. Here, the number next to the M indicates the number of movement points that the unit has. Uh, the letter that you find here represents the order in which units attack in combat. We'll see what that means. And here you have three numbers that represent the combat power to be used against, respectively, um, air units, naval units, and ground units. So the way I remember that is ang, air, naval, ground. Ang, because when you go to war, you're angry. Not necessarily, but you helps you remember what those numbers are for and in which kind of combat we're going to use them. Now, at the beginning of each turn, you are going to have first an initiative phase. Players roll two dice. Uh, the game only uses six-sided dice. You roll two dice, the player with the highest total uh, goes first, is the first player. Then you have the move phase in which both players can move units and in all their units up to their full movement allowance. Of course, there are restrictions. You can send ships in the middle of the land, in landlocked areas. You, uh, air units usually will need to end their movement in a city or in a town. All cities and towns are assumed to have airports. It's also possible, however, that you want to move them and you move them where they will attack, and then after combat they will need to spend the remaining movement points to reach a town or city. 
What I do to keep track of that, because uh, I may not remember from the movement phase and then the combat phase, what I do is I use six-sided dice that don't come with the game and I put them next to the air unit as a reminder of how many um, movement points it spent. I was there, one, two, three movement points. So after combat, I know that this unit has five movement points. So it can move two more axes and after combat, it can land there, for example. Um, so land units will be on land, duh. <laughs> and then we have naval units that will move in full um, water, full sea axis, or you can move in coastal axis. And during movement, uh, there are different units that can do a couple of creative things. So paratroopers, so they can work, they can travel for a little while as, as air units, but then they land. Marines, what's important about them is that they can and perform sea invasions, that is, they can land in non-friendly access. You can move land units in sea access, however, they need to uh, they need to land in a friendly port. That means pretty much that they are soon to be traveling on non-combat ships, and they can do that after after a breachhead, after some form of control of the destination has been created. So, you follow different rules for the way the blocks move, but the idea is still as the first player moves any and all of their blocks, and then the second player moves any and all of their blocks, that have not been pinned. When the first player enters a space containing enemy units, nothing happens for the time being, you don't have a battle just yet, but that means that an equal number of blocks is pinned down and cannot exit from there. So I entered there, as first player is red, entered there with two blocks, two blocks are in that hex and are stuck there. However, that may also mean that I add a block there and then I move with another block there. As a second player, I can in fact bring units in, knowing that there will be a battle, and I can reinforce the battle. But it's important that I keep the blocks that arrive separate from the blocks that were there at the beginning, as in fact uh, that will be important during combat. The first round of combat only, the blocks that invaded and the blocks that were already there will participate in combat. Starting from round two, the blocks that arrived later will be able to enter. First player moves and possibly start some battles and pins down some blocks. Second player moves and possibly starts some other battles. And then we get to the combat phase, combat re resolution. We go back to the first player who will then resolve the battles that have been started by, by he or she. So the first player resolves battles that have been started by the first player, in which the first player is the attacker. Say this one here. You reveal all blocks that were that invaded and that were there at the beginning and then the battle is ready to start. Units will fight in the order indicated here. So the A units fire first, then B units, C units, D units and E units. And within each letter rank, the defender goes first. So, for example, here we have only an A, is the other attacker, so we roll dice to determine the attack of that unit. We don't have any Bs, we don't have any Cs. We have Ds for both the attacker and the defender, the attacker and the defender, and then the D block of the defender attacks, then the D block of the attacker attacks, because we remember within a letter, defender goes first, then we only have one E belonging to the defender, and the defender uh, rolls for that. Then, starting from round two, the units that reinforce the battle are also added to the battle. Look at this, we have another, we have another D block. What you do when you attack is, if a unit that attacks rolls a number of dice equal to its current uh, strength, number of strength points. This unit will roll four, four six-sided dice. And you score a hit when you roll equal to or lower than your combat value for the target that you're attacking. When you attack with a unit, you declare not a single target unit, but a class, air, naval, or ground. So, for example, this, this uh, 
this air unit here will score a hit when attacking air will score a hit so when rolling a three two or one cannot attack naval and can score a hit against round units only on a one remember is equal to or lower than air naval ground so this unit is attacking the ground unit there that this unit will roll four six other dice and will score a hit for each one again I made a mistake there. It does not attack that unit, it attacks ground units, because then it will be up to the owning player to assign those casualties. Oh, this unit rolled and it actually scored two ones, so now that's two hits, two hits on the opponent, and the opponent has to assign hits, and the hits needs to be assigned to the strongest units, and so the defender does that. Then we go back to the D units of the defender. This defender will roll two dice, can only attack ground units. You see there's zero and zero for air and naval. And so we'll attack ground units and roll two dice and we'll score a hit on the opponent for each one or two that is rolled. And again, each hit reduces the opponent by one. There, is a, there are a number of rules about who can attack whom, for example, land units can attack air units only if they have been attacked, naval units can attack land units in coastal axis only if there aren't other naval units. The idea is that basically you have to defend against your own class of unit if it is there before you can go out and attack other people and ground units usually can attack units only if, they're, if those are other ground units or if they are retaliating if they've been attacked say by air or naval combat lasts up to three rounds uh, well it, it lasts less in one side if one side is completely wiped out if at the end of the third round there's still units of both sides uh, in the x then the attacker has to retreat and that's pretty much, in essence, is how combat works. It will be very familiar to you if you played other Columbia games, because this is pretty much a system that is shared by all or most of their war games. After combat has been resolved, you check supply. Units need to be able to trace a supply line. Units are in supply if they are on a road or adjacent to a road that then can trace an uninterrupted line to a city, a town is not good enough, units that are not in supply will lose a step each. After that, uh, players check the cities that they control, cities will give them a number of production points, and they can then spend those production points, remember, to build new units, step one, and then adding steps, or to add steps to reduce the units on the board. However, those steps need to be spent in the hex in which they are produced. So if this unit is here, uh, that hex produces two production points. Uh, ah, it takes two production points to give a step to this unit and then I give it that step there. And we're good, and we're good to go. <laughs> Summarizing, you start each turn with an initiative roll, then player one moves, player two moves, player one declares combats or resolves the combats that he or she started, player two resolves combats that he or she started, check for supply, produce new steps, and you continue like this, and you continue like this until one of the players has met the victory conditions of the scenario. I like victory a lot. There's actually a big commitment here. Maybe one of those few games that I would bring with me on a desert island. Now, of course, there's the minus that if it's desert, it's just me. Uh, I'll have to play solo and it's still very fine. However, the game does shine against another, another player or multiple players. You can still play solo with the blocks face up, both side, playing both sides the best of your possibilities. You lose a little bit of the fog of war, but you still have a lot of fun with working with combined arms, uh, supply lines, different types of operations that will come from different types of landscapes. Definitely the game shines. However, when you're playing against another opponent and you're using fog of war and so you're trying to set up traps and try to avoid the traps of the opponent, reinforcements that you didn't expect the opponent would be able to bring there, that kind of stuff really makes the game shine, but the game is still great, uh, even if you play solo. It is a perfect desert island game in the sense that it has, you're on a desert island, you're not gonna have a big game store there, 
it is perfect for that situation due to the replay value. The game really is a sandbox, there's just so much stuff that you can do with this game. With different maps, different scenarios, different conditions. It's a desert island, but then we got other castaways that are coming there. No matter how many they're coming, we can still play. You can set up a large scenario, and even if you're playing with two countries, you can have different types of specialization. One player controls naval, one player's air forces, one player ground forces, then you have a player that is a politician, the politician decides where the production goes. You can have multiple politicians fighting together before they decide how the production goes. By splitting roles and with more than two countries, you can really accommodate a larger number of people that you would otherwise. You could have epic games that last all day, and I don't think they would be bored. I mean, I, I play a game, it was a two-player game, it lasted about like five hours, and we were not tired at the end. We were excited by how fun and epic the whole thing had been. So, it's a great game because it can have this epic span, but at the same time, at the core, it is a fairly simple game. In fact, it could definitely work as an introductory game. It's a, if it is the first war game that you ever played, this is something you can teach yourself. You can definitely play with other friends that have never played a war games. I have, in fact, played with, with people that had not played uh, Hex Encounter or Block War Games or traditional war games before. No problem whatsoever. People, gamers that have played, you know, heavyweight, normal non war game games, that it would be able to play this one. So it can definitely work as a beginner war game, as a introductory war games. And yet, there are several introductory war games that sort of like water things down. But this is a fully fleshed war game. It has so much detail, so much chrome, so much variety, so much new ones. But the good thing is that all that work has been done for you by all the information that has been hardwired into those blocks. You don't have to remember Oh, wait a second, there's a rule that tells me that torpedo bombers cannot attack land units. No, their factor for land, for ground combat is zero. It is there. Their factor for other types of combat works differently. So simply by placing different types of numbers on those blocks, it seems easy, but of course a lot of work goes into it, by uh, tweaking the stats of the blocks to represent historical factors, a lot of work has been done for you. You cannot play to too much uh, anti-historically simply because the blocks will not allow you. I really like the subtitle being the blocks of war. It really is about the blocks and the blocks in a certain sense direct the action but they don't railroad it. You're forced to work within the possibilities, capabilities and limitations of the blocks of all the different units, how they work. But again you have so much detail there and you don't have to learn rules about it. Look at what the blocks tell you and you'll figure out what the best ways of using them are. As for the game system around those blocks, it's classic Columbia games. Actually, I, I see here that the first edition was from 1999, at least the maps say copyright 1999. So that's, uh, well, we have had a lot of uh, Columbia games that came after that one, so that tells you this is one of the classic ones. And chances are, if you played other Columbia War games, you already know how to play this one. If anything, you had to unlearn some of the specific things that maybe other games added. You had to unlearn something uh, from Julius Caesar or from other games that came later and that used the same system. This is, a sense, in a sense, is the core, the core of the Columbia, uh, Columbia game system. All these things that you know, that you're familiar with, that you love, are here. So they will make it so easy for you to jump into the game if you're familiar with the game. It will provide you with a very reasonable learning curve if you're completely new to the word gaming side of the, of the gaming hobby. So, Victory. Victory is a great set. I do recommend that you um, invest a little bit and you get the extra maps and you get the extra armies because then you really have a game that you can play with so many different people, so hardcore war gamers, newbies, you can play it in so many different situations and you can just create so many different games. The replay value 
is of the charts and the play value is very high because let's not forget we play value is nothing if the game is not fun to play but victory happens to be a really excellent war game to play so highly recommended